Good morning. morning. How is everyone this morning? Actually, it's a pretty, pretty nice morning, isn't it? Uh, My name is Brian, for those of you that don't know me, and uh, it's my privilege to dig into God's Word with you this morning. It's nice to to be back in person. Uh, I know you've had to like a watch of virtual me lately, but uh, here we are again. And today uh, we are going to be in Mark uh, chapter 10 this morning. Uh, when have you ever been? When have you been the most uh, gutted in your life? Most disappointed? Maybe you had some really high hopes for something, and it looked like it was going to go really well. It's just going to be great, but then at the last moment, it all sort of fell through. Maybe for those of you, I don't know if anyone likes to fish, you know, and you had the fish of a lifetime on the end of your line. And just as you were thinking about bringing it into hand, suddenly it all goes slack and it's like, oh. Or if you play sports or maybe football, soccer, whatever, and there is the open goal in front of you. And all you have to do is tap it in, but somehow you manage to send it wide of the post. Or you worked really, really hard on a paper at college or school and, and uh, you thought that it was going to be so good and it comes back to you and it's just like red all round and circles and lines and this and that and you just, oh. Yeah. Or maybe it's a relationship uh, and you had this relationship and you thought it was going to go somewhere. Well, maybe kind of uh, like this. Well, that obviously didn't quite go the way Griffin was planning or expected, did it? You know, if, he, if he'd known she was going to say no, he, he never would have asked the question. And hopefully uh, none of you have ever been through that. But maybe we've all faced disappointments, right? Maybe you had that dream job that you applied for and the interview seemed to go really well. And they seem to be on board and they said, we'll be, we'll be in touch soon. And then time just kind of ticked past and you kind of wondered what was happening and you reached out and, oh, sorry, we've decided to go in a different direction. And you're just like, oh, absolutely gutted. Or maybe it was a place that you wanted to move to and uh, you got it all planned and it was, looked like it was going to happen. And then at the last minute, it, it fell through. Or maybe it, maybe it happens and you actually move to the place, right? And uh, it turns out not to be at all what you hoped it to be. Or the person said yes to your proposal and that relation turned out not to be so happy after all. You get the job and it's not so great after all. I mean, I guess disappointments, right, are, are, are just all part of, of life. And sometimes what we think is going to be so good turns out to be not so good after all. And sometimes that's down to us. And sometimes we just have unrealistic expectations, don't we? And those, uh, we kind of talked about this before, those expectations will get you every time. (laughs) And especially if they're unrealistic. But you know, we all want what is good for us, don't we? But how do we know what is good for us because really you know it spoiler alert if you've never seen that film it would not have been good for griffin to marry stephanie frankly because their values were different and their outlook on life was different so how do we know what is good for us where can we go to who can tell us what is good for us and even if we're told what is good for us do we really want to hear that (laughs) How can we end up not disappointed, not gutted? Well, in this passage uh, that we're going to read this morning, we continue in our series, God Questions. And uh, this man comes to uh, Jesus seeking an answer. And he's pretty sure that what he's going to be told is what he wants to hear. And it's going to be good. Because why else? Ask the question, right? But he leaves absolutely gutted. Jesus asks him, what what is good, basically? And maybe this man had never really considered that before. Uh, And clearly his idea of what is good is not the same idea as Jesus. 
So what about us this morning? What is our idea of what is good? Let's read Mark 10, chapter, uh, chapter 10, verse 17 through 30, uh, 31. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these I've kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible but not with God, for all things are possible with God. And Peter began to say to him, See, we've left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left houses or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life but many who are first will be last and the last first i i confess um as i'm kind of shallow the times that i have been probably most gutted uh at times uh sports right <laughs> And, you know, the, the, the more you care about something, right, the more you set yourself up to be gutted. <laughs> and Caleb's laughing with me here. And, uh, you know, teams have their ups and downs, right? Uh, and so the expectation is when the team is good, you know, they're going to do well. But when they're bad, well, uh, you know, the expectation should be lower, right? Uh, but as uh, many of you know and others, you probably realize, you know, I, I am English and uh, I have supported England all my life. Uh, and being an England supporter, I have to, uh, you won't know all this, but it comes with a tremendous sense of expectation, especially in the World Cup, which is every four years, right? Uh, and the thing is that England has only ever won it once in 1966, which was a long time ago now. Not even I remember that. <laughs> But it doesn't stop like the whole country every four years. And the expectation is that this year we're going to win it, whether we have a good team or a complete rubbish team, right? The expectation builds and builds and builds. And you think, oh, this time I'm not going to get drawn into that. But you just can't help yourself. And at the end, of course, you know, and we've gone out in some terrible ways on penalties and stuff. And it just leaves you absolutely Got it. If only, right, there was something nailed on that didn't leave you like that. And I know that's kind of the beauty of sports, right? You never quite know what's going to happen. But, you know, if there was something that would not leave you disappointed at the end, the job that was always satisfying and meaningful, the relationship that was always fulfilling and life-giving, a life with no disappointments, where would you find such a life. You ever think about all these people that came to Jesus, most of them had great disappointments in their lives. They had illnesses. Their bodies didn't work. They were broken. Or, or their minds were clouded and occupied with evil spirits. 
and they came from the wrong side of town. And so they came to Jesus to be healed and have their disappointments taken away. But this rich man, what kind of disappointments do you think he had in his life? I mean, financially, right? He was rich. <laughs> he, he wasn't disappointed financially. He, he was young. He had his whole life before him. And presumably because he was young, he was pretty fit and healthy. And uh, he, you know, he was living a good, moral, upright life. So why did he come to Jesus, do you suppose? What was he hoping to find in Jesus? Perhaps it was the weight of expectation to be good. You ever feel that weight of expectation just to be good? I don't know if you've seen, I'm going to use a few film illustrations today. Yeah, Saving Private Ryan, anyone seen that film, right? And you know what that's about, is this, this platoon is sent off to save, uh, find this guy, uh, Private Ryan, he, in World War II, he's beyond enemy, enemy lines. Uh, and eventually they find him, right? And um, there's a final battle and most of them die. And Captain Miller, who's the one that's led this platoon, he's lying there dying and he gets Ryan to come down and he whispers in, in Ryan's ear, earn this. And then there's this kind of poignant scene at the end of the film, which is however many years later, uh, and Ryan is an, an older man, old man now, and he's gone to Normandy, and he's standing before the grave uh, of Captain Miller, uh, and he has his family with him, and he asks his wife, tell me I've been a good man. Because he's spent his whole life trying to be good enough to earn the death of Captain Miller and the rest of, of the men. Had he done enough? How, how would he ever know that he had done enough to, to earn that, right? What would Captain Miller say if he was alive? Would he say, yes, you've done enough, or would he be disappointed? And I don't know if all of us live to some extent or another, right, with Captain Miller's whispering in our ear or, or insert your own Captain Miller. Maybe it's your parents or maybe it's your boss or maybe it's your spouse or maybe, probably, it could even, right, be yourself that you're not good enough. You have your own idea of what good is and you're striving to earn it, you're striving to get it, but you have this impossibly high expectation and no wonder you keep falling short all the time because what is good and when is good enough? How will I know and who can tell me? Well, the first place we might look for that is by asking good people because the man approaches Jesus and he asks, Good master, right? And Jesus replies, well, why do you call me good? There's nobody good except God alone. What is our idea of a good person? I guess it's kind of sub subjective, isn't it? We know we could have different ideas. Often we attach uh, someone who is skilled at what they do. Well, that person's a good doctor, right? Or that person's a good player as opposed to someone who's not skilled, right? You don't want to go to a bad doctor, do you now? <laughs> but also, it's more than just skill, right? Somebody uh, who is relatable is often good, too. They might be a good doctor and have all the skill in the world, but if they have a terrible bedside manner, <laughs> then we think, oh, they're not such a good doctor after all. <laughs> just to... Uh, uh, the, I, I mentioned that, that the only time England won the World Cup was in 66, and just about all that team is dead now, by the way. And uh, there's only one left alive, and the one just died a few weeks ago. And uh, I happened to meet him one time. Bobby, Rob um, Bobby Charlton was his name. And uh, he was a really great guy. He just got out of a taxi. Me and my mate were walking down this road, and he jumped out, and he came over and talked to us for five, ten minutes. And we were like... And uh, reading in the papers, you know, his obituary, and that was what everyone said about Bobby Charlton, that he was a good man. 
And maybe the rich young ruler had the same idea about Jesus. That Jesus was a good man because he was skilled, right? He, he knew the Torah. He knew it inside out. He knew how to read it. He knew how to interpret it. And he applied it. He didn't just shut himself away in his study, right? Doing academic work, but he was out. He, he genuinely cared for people. He had a great bedside manner, didn't he? He took time and he told stories. And he was generally down with people unlike so many of the, the leaders around him. And he lived life, and he was relatable. He was a good man. Uh, and many people have the same idea of Jesus today, don't they? That Jesus was a good person because of all that stuff, because he is relatable. But it doesn't really differentiate Jesus, does it? Because, you know, the idea today is, well, we're all basically good. You know, yeah, we, we might have done a few disappointing things in our lives here and there. But basically, unless you're Hamas or ISIS, you, we're all kind of good, right? But unfortunately, that's not really what the Bible says, is it? In fact, Paul, reflecting on Scripture in Romans, says, It's written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside together, they've become worthless. No one does good, not even one. So what Jesus is pointing the man to is this, right? That, that no one is good except God. So why is this man calling Jesus good <clears throat> does he recognize that jesus is actually god is, is that why he's calling him good because the only person who can be arbiter of good is the person that knows really what good is and the only person who knows what good is is in fact god because often we talk about jesus being good but we use our definition to apply to jesus what is good right we don't use God's definition. And we think of good as someone who has empathy with us and tells us what we want to hear and keeps us from being disappointed in life. But God doesn't do that. That's not God's idea of goodness. Sometimes God lets disappointments happen in our lives. Yet God is still good. Because here's the thing, we have to get past our idea of what, God, uh, what good is. I always you know, think of uh, the lion and the witch and the wardrobe. And uh, when Peter and Susan and Lucy, uh, they meet the beavers, <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, uh, and Mr. and Mrs. Beaver start telling the ch children uh, uh, about Aslan. Ooh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, and no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or else just silly. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver told you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. I'm longing to see him, said Peter, even if I do feel frightened when it comes to that point. Later on, of course, they get, they get to meet Aslan in person. And uh, Lewis says that, as for Aslan himself, the beavers and the children didn't know what to do or say when they saw him. People who have not been in Narnia sometimes think that a thing cannot be good and terrible at the same time. If the children had ever thought so, they were cured of it now, for when they tried to look at Aslan's face, they just caught a glimpse of the golden mane and the great, royal, solemn, overwhelming eyes, and then they found that they couldn't look at him and went all trembling. God is good. But that doesn't mean that God is safe, and it doesn't mean that God <laughs> conforms to our, our, our ideal of what goodness is. 
I always like, you know, in the beginning in the book of Revelation, the apostle John ha has a vision of the risen Christ. This, this is the same John that had laid his head on Jesus at the Last Supper. And this is what John says, I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters." In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Jesus is the only one who is good. Secondly, we might look uh, for good works. Jesus tells the man, you know the commandments, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, don't defraud, honor your mother and father. You know, here's another film, right? Brewster's Millions. Yeah, no, everyone seen any ever seen that one? It's kind of an old film now, but uh, Brewster's like this kind of old, uh, washed-up baseball player, and uh, he inherits three hundred million dollars. But there's a catch because first of all, he has to spend thirty million dollars within, and I think it's like a month, right? And he has to end up with no money to his name in order to inherit the the three hundred million. This man asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? How do I earn my inheritance? And he figures that how well he does will depend on how much inheritance he gets. You know, the, the, the measure of goodness is often by what people do, isn't it? And people thought that the Messiah was going to be good. And the Messiah was going to do good, good things. And the most important good thing that the Messiah was going to do was the Messiah was going to return Israel back to her former glory. Except Jesus didn't really show much interest in that, did he? He, he, was no, he, he was not interested in returning Israel back to her former glory. He was not interested in nationalism whatsoever. He was interested in people, but not in the state. Indeed, instead, what Jesus did was he healed, he touched, he cast out demons, he provided resources, he even raised a few people back from the dead. But he wasn't into nation building at all. And so they thought, well, I don't know if this Jesus can be the Messiah because he's not really doing the one good thing that we really wanted him to do. And some of the good stuff that he does is on the Sabbath. And who does that kind of thing on the Sabbath? Because that breaks all the rules and regulations. And then when we start bringing that up with Jesus, he starts going on about how our rules and regulations aren't God's rules and regulations. So, so really, how good can this Jesus be? Another measure of whether someone is good or not is often we, dip, we look at where they come from, right? Do they come from a good place, a good background? We don't know where this rich young man came from. But back in Jesus' day, the best people came from Jerusalem. And the further away you got from Jerusalem, the less good... You were. And for Jesus, well, where did he come from? He came from Galilee. That was a long way from Jerusalem. And you may remember the story in John, you know, where Philip goes to find his, his mate, uh, Nathaniel, to tell Nathaniel, well, we found the Messiah. And Nathaniel's going, oh, yeah, where's he from? Oh, he's from Nazareth. And Nathaniel goes, 
Can anything good come from Nazareth? But ultimately, Jesus was not crucified, was he, for his good works. In fact, Jesus had multiple showdowns with the Jews, didn't he? One time Jesus asked them, uh, told them, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? And the Jews answered him, it's not for good works that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself to be God. They kept demanding good works. They kept demanding more signs. But Jesus could never do enough, could he, to, to prove to them that he was good enough. Not that he was trying to prove that to them. Because he already knew that he had the approval of his father. He was good because he had the approval of his father. His, his inheritance was given on who he is, not on what he does. Because inheritances are not earned, are they? They're given. We're not in some episode of succession here in our lives, right? We don't do good works to, to earn an inheritance. We, we do good works because the inheritance has already been given to us through Jesus Christ. And the inheritance that we've been given to us through Jesus Christ you cannot spend it all. <laughs> no matter how hard you might try, you could not spend it all ever. It's inexhaustible. Because through Jesus Christ, we are God's children. It is Jesus Christ who makes us good. Apostle Paul, he realized all of that. And he said, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving Lord Christ. So good works are a result of our inheritance. They're not a means to our inheritance. So how can we get all well, what is good? Well, the only way is through the good news. The man tells Jesus, right, that he's kept all those laws since he was young, right? And, and no doubt he is absolutely sincere when he says that, that he absolutely means that. But is his goodness good enough? Well, no, it's not. Because Jesus looks at him and Jesus loves him. And, and that's an important part, right? Because Jesus could have said, yeah, you're fine, go off you go. But Jesus knows that that's not enough, right? And because he loves him, he, he wants to share with him that this man is still off base. That at the end of his life, he's going to be disappointed. And he tells the man to go and sell all his possessions and give the money to the poor and, and then come and follow him. And the man goes off gutted waving away the mariachi band and ignoring the damp fireworks in the distance. And the disciples are gobsmacked because this bloke, he has rich and he's doing everything right and he looks so good. And if he can't be saved, then who can? And Jesus says, it is impossible. Not, not that it's slightly possible, but it is completely impossible. Like trying to get a camel through the eye of a ne needle. But what is impossible with human beings is possible with God. Because it's a different matter with God. And pipe Peter, doesn't he? Good old Peter. He pipes up, whoa, you know, we've left everything. I left my business, my family, fish, you know, we've come and followed you. What are we going to get, <laughs> right? <laughs> and Jesus says, well, you're going to get a hundred times more of that, right? If you come and follow me in this lifetime, he says. And then he adds the caveat with some disappointments some persecutions as well. You know, as I said, inheritances can't be 
earned. They can only be received. And I know some people give inheritances and they try and, you know, attach strings to the inheritances and they kind of try to control people from beyond the grave kind of thing. And, you know, that just really doesn't work well. It shows kind of lack of trust, lack of love, doesn't it? But Jesus really wanted to give this man the inheritance of eternal life. He wanted to give him the entry into the kingdom of God. But first he needed to go and spend what was keeping him from getting in. Not to earn it, but because those riches were his God. He, he was relying on those riches from keeping him from having disappointments, right? They had become his God. Now, Jesus was not issuing a blanket statement, right, to say to every single person that every person before they can follow Jesus needs to go and sell everything they have and come follow him. That's, but it is hard for people who have a lot of possessions to follow Jesus because it is so tempting to make that stuff your God and rely on that stuff instead of Jesus. But there are other different kinds of riches in this world, aren't there? There's riches of knowledge, there's riches of talent, riches of nationality, place, if you like. Peter said he'd left everything to follow Jesus. But had he? He hadn't left his pride behind, though, had he? And he took that with him. It may have looked like he was following Jesus, but when it came down to it, was he really following Jesus? Because the night before Jesus died, he, Peter promised Jesus, you know, if everyone else leaves you, I will never leave you. In fact, I, Peter, I, Peter, Jesus will die with you. But of course that didn't happen, did it? Because before the night was over, the cock crowed and, and Peter had denied Jesus three times that he even knew him. And it wasn't really until Peter realized that what was really preventing him from following Jesus was his pride, and he broke down and he cried. It's kind of like the prodigal son, you know, and he got his inheritance, didn't he? And he went off, and, he, and it wasn't until he'd spent all that, and he was feeding pigs, and Luke says, then he came to his right mind. Oh! I could go back to my father as a servant. But he got welcomed back as a son. Jesus is looking at us here this morning as we call him good. And he loves us. But what would Jesus, or what is Jesus maybe, asking you to put aside here this morning? Maybe there's something that you're holding on to that is preventing you from truly following Jesus. And if you set it aside, how would that leave you? Disappointed? Gutted? Maybe Jesus is asking you to move somewhere or, or to do something or get rid of something. I don't know what it might be. But the question is, do we see Jesus as good? As he defines himself as good? You know, Jesus had asked the man uh, about the commandments, but I don't know if you noticed that, but he asked the man about the commandments as they related to people. And the man said, of course, yeah, I've, I've done all that stuff, all that good stuff to other people. But the last part where Jesus tells the man to go and sell his possessions actually addresses the first commandment, doesn't it? You shall have no other gods before me. And the bad news for us is that we have all had other gods before Jesus. That's what gets us into trouble in the first place. And as long as we have other gods before God, we can't get in to the kingdom of heaven. But the new good news is that we can inherit eternal life through Jesus Christ. He wants to give us eternal life. 
if we were willing to give up our earthly ones. Of course, that doesn't mean that we won't face disappointments when we follow Jesus. He, he said we will, right? There will still be times when we're gutted. But we have that knowledge and we have that faith that even though we face difficult times, in the end, we will not be disappointed. The old Apostle Paul, he, he went through some tough times. He was definitely disappointed at times. But writing to the Philippians, he says, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul wasn't the slightest bit gutted that he'd met Jesus. And I hope that none of us are here this morning either. You know, it's likely that Jesus doesn't always give us the answers that we're looking for, right? Especially if we're just looking for some validation of what we're doing but Jesus loves us and he is good and he died on a cross and was raised again from the dead and that is the good news that he offers up to us this morning to put our faith and trust in him and if we do that when it comes to the end of our lives we will never be gutted what's God speaking to you right now we're going to Time to reflect. Uh, Water and faith are going to come up and uh, play a song. Uh, I invite you to grab the elements of the communion. They're sitting on that table over there. Don't take them. Uh, We'll take them together after the song. But just consider now what, what your definition of good is and what God's definition of good is. And consider how good God is now as we sing.